Let me introduce myself and what I'll be talking about today. So uh, my name is Dan Remar. I'm Assistant Professor of Hospitality and Food Industry Management in the Department of Ag and Applied Economics. And today I'm going to be presenting sort of two pieces from the Ag Forecast. One is our hospitality and agritourism and travel outlook. And then I'm also going to talk about Georgia's beverage industry, which is uh, the piece that I've sort of worked on. So I'm going to spend about 10 or 15 minutes just on agritourism, and then I'm going to jump right into um, local foods and Georgia beverage um, snapshot. Okay, so just a brief definition. What is tourism, hospitality, agritourism? I'll just sort of preface this just to give us a snapshot. Right, Travel and tourism is like it's a sociological piece, looking at the behaviors around travel, the motivations. Why are people going to this? What are they looking for? Hospitality is the business applications where the business of travel happens, right? So you travel to a destination or where you stay, what you eat, what you do, that's hospitality, right? So that's sort of the, the lens that I'm bringing in in terms of um, definitions, okay? So how do we align this idea of hospitality, tourism, and it's all centered around economic development and community economic development. And it's about buying from the stakeholders within that community, right? You think about, um, you know, this, I like the idea is that hospitality and tourism activities play that key role in community development, whether it's a urban community or a rural community, right? You have the accommodations tax, which I'm not gonna go too much into, but the more people you have coming in and staying at a hotel, right? That community, that town, uh, that money goes to marketing of that destination, right? So the more people that you come in, they're spending money in that local economy. They're eating at the restaurants, right? So the idea of hospitality tourism is, is from this perspective, closely aligned with community economic development. So just to talk about agritourism, just out of curiosity, how many of y'all are familiar with agritourism? Okay, so, so most of y'all, but the idea of, and this has been a growing segment with nationally, but also within Georgia, but the idea of having activities on farms, so the definition is a commercial enterprise, and I'll, I'll automatically, this, when we presented uh, at the extension conference, this piece about having a commercial enterprise on a farm can be a bit, we've, I've heard from operators that this is actually a challenge, but the idea is that it is um, some sort of activities that are happening on farm that's really linking the idea of tourism and travel, but also ag production people traveling to the farm to learn about the products, but also to engage in other types of activities, right? So just to give you an example, okay, so there's lots of forms of agritourism, right? You have direct sales, people coming to the orchard, say, to, uh, just to purchase apples, right? But then you have picking, right? So you have, there's also educational um, seminars that are happening. You have different hospitality of restaurants, people setting up food and beverage operations on the farm, on property, but also entertainment. You think about corn mazes, you think about um, festivals and things like that. Um, so the idea of farmers work is to pick your own, cut your own Christmas trees. The idea is to get, you know, if you think about the farms are producing and what we've heard a lot today is producing commodities or uh, producing, like how can we get more people on the farm, right? So that you have another opportunity for another revenue source, okay? So, um, Agritourism and that is, is really important in getting people on there and having those activities like farm tours, different seminars. Um, if any of y'all have been to the Georgia Safari down there in Metter, I think this is from there, um, one of my favorite places. But again, it's it's farm related activities. Okay. Um, and where hospitality comes in is there are people wanting to do these sort of hospitality experiences on agricultural properties, right? So you have people staying at the farm, right? Learning, they'll go and visit, they'll help pick some of the, the vegetables, they'll produce it on farm, right? They'll stay on property. You have uh, properties opening up restaurants where they're using their own produce, right? Right into the food production. Um, I got married in a barn myself, okay? So like weddings are a big one where you get, you know, is that uh, idyllic setting, you're out in nature, it's beautiful, okay? And then you see bed and breakfasts popping up around. So. There is all this activity, hospitality activity happening um, on farm. Again, also recreation. And this is where, depending on the resources, but, you know, we have we talked to, uh, there's hunting lodges, fishing lodges, um, horseback riding, hiking, right? All these different types of activities that can happen on a wide a range of um, farm types of properties. 
again, yeah, just again, if you're thinking about, we want to bring people onto the farm to generate revenue in that method. I mean, you see also concerts and festivals are really big, okay, especially uh, some of the around the seasons. I know there's a big like pumpkin festival. Um, you know, you go, you pay an entry fee, you go in, you so you automatically pay a fee, then you go in, you might cut some flowers, you pay some more money, you spend a lot of money on the concessions. So it is potential to have a lot of revenue generation. So just to give you an idea about agritourism in the U.S., um, about 2 million farms, about 153,000 offered this direct sale of, tour, of agritourism, right? So people coming to that farm to purchase. Um, and it is, you know, it is sort of a, a growing, like it's, uh, increase significantly. Some of the data that's presented is, is they haven't done a snapshot done for agritourism in the USDA. The last census they did was 2017. So some of the data here is old. They're gonna, I think the next one comes out actually um, next month. So we'll have updated data. But what we've seen is a um, increase of popularity of agritourism in Georgia, okay? Um, we had about 5%, 5.5% farms reported they offer some sort of agritourism activity or product. And I like this map because you get to see where in the counties is agritourism really popular and important in terms of sort of economic development, right? This is just the number of people coming in. You can see, um, you know, obviously of your metropolitan areas, but up in North Georgia particularly um, is really important, right? Especially, and we'll talk more about that, especially when we get to, when I get to wineries. Um, so, I have a question. Yeah. The more red, the more number. Correct. Yes. So just to go back. Yes. Right. Heavily. Um, this is lots of agritourism activity. Okay. By the county level. Um, and actually, we have a link to some of it. Uh, it's a more a snapshot about county level data in terms of. Um, sort of economic generation, which I'll get to in a minute. But this gives you an idea of where the agritourism sort of um, activities are happening most across the county, across the state. Um, so yeah, Gilmer, Fulton, but Hall, Henry, White County, there's a lot of around beverage uh, wineries, Georgia's wine segment, which I'll get to in a little bit. We've sort of come up with our own um, sort of Mediterranean, our own sort of wine destination, similar to California in some respects. But you see a lot of agritourism, especially around these wineries, breweries, and distilleries. Okay. Um, and about 9% of the attractions contain restaurant or other food service. So it just gives you an idea of like what people's expectations are when they're coming to um, engage in some sort of agritourism activity. Okay. They're looking for an experience. Okay. Um, so where do we rank in terms of um, agritourism farms? North Carolina, I mean, we're blocked here, but we're, we rank third. Uh, this is in the Southeast. Um, North Carolina, Florida, just ahead of us. But what's interesting is in terms of income, Georgia has the highest agritourism income per operation than all of our other competitors in the state. So this just reflects there are people, it is a, it is, I don't want to say it's a cultural phenomenon, but in some sense, it is. There is a, it ties into that, um, you know, want to know your farmer, but wanting to know where your food comes from, but really kept connecting to that community. Um, and we see it's very um, profitable within Georgia. Um, and yeah, just trends. Again, we can see that Georgia, this again, it's just on this upward trajectory. Okay. This number, this is 2017, it's definitely going to grow as when we get this next flood of data. So segueing a little bit from, now it's all kind of late when we talk about sort of agritourism, tourism, hospitality, but when we think about rural communities and especially rural community development, agritourism and really hospitality plays a really important role, okay? So uh, from a visitor, we did a survey um, in 2020. So again, this data was around somewhat influenced by COVID, but we saw a lot of people traveling within state. So we were able to collect some data around travel sentiments, and we found that for um, almost all, 45%, so almost 50% of that travel money, this money spent while traveling, was on accommodations and food. So people are staying at the hotels, or staying on farm, and also buying food, right? They're engaging in some of these um, economic activities. Um, so you can see how it breaks down. 
food and beverage, significant, um, and lodging, somewhat, right? But this just shows how that, again, that food movement ties into it. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but we can see spending um, across rural communities has increased significantly. 24, almost 25% increase in hotel spending in rural communities. So you see there's people are traveling, especially say from cities, traveling out to rural communities and exploring the state, okay? So we see that both in hotels and in restaurant spendings in rural communities. So there is a um, trend within Georgia of residents um, going out to the rural communities, but this is also um, people traveling from outside the state are also engaging in some of these rural tourism activities. Okay, so what's the snapshot for sort of agritourism in the accommodation sector? It's, occupancy is expected to grow. People are just, it's still some of this pent up maybe COVID demand. I think it's people are just, they like to travel. Okay, so we're going to see continued travel and that's going to be continued growth trickling down across sort of the hospitality sector. Um, 4.3 increase in total number of trips. Um, spending is going to increase. Um, and Georgia is really, I mean, we are well positioned for this because if you think about the diversity of our resources, we got mountains, we got plains, we got the ocean, right? We got almost everything is in terms of destinations. We have cultural history, we have music history, right? There is um, all these different types of hospitality products that make our state uniquely, um, that makes us different, but also there is a good opportunity to connect um, farm owners, property owners, with some of these um, activities that are ongoing. Um, I put on the slate. We can I can show it later. But what, back to your point, we have a we created a, a snapshot county by county where you can look and see economic impact of um, each county across the state. So we have all 159 counties. What is their economic impact in terms of food uh, and accommodations income? Um, so you get to see, and this is a, a helpful tool, especially when we start talking about um, extension. Um, okay, so here's sort of a little bit about my piece of sort of connecting the dots, right? Where, how else can we increase revenues, but also sort of build these connections between ag producers and the consumer, right? So, you know, in the, in, in we heard a lot in, in the first bit, just about, you know, producing food to go to retail. Well, 50% of the food dollar, right, the amount that America, or the consumer spends on food goes to restaurants, right, food away from home. So that means people are eating out a lot, right? I mean, and it's, that number is only going up. And if you think about it, people are always going to go out to eat, right? So there's always sort of a built-in demand. Um, but so where can we think about all this food getting produced? A lot of it's going to in commodities, which we'll hear about, but are there other opportunities to make those other connections to perhaps our food and beverage operations? So Georgia has 19,000 food and beverage operations that goes from limited service to like a concession to all the way up to full service, but that's a lot. Okay, we have a lot of eating and drinking establishments. Um, so how can we facilitate that connection between the producers of food and the consumers within the restaurant industry? They are consumers in the restaurant. Uh, but why this is so important is because from a national perspective, restaurant consumers, and I think every consumer in general, um, is demanding local food, right? I mean, how many of y'all are familiar with the farm to table movement, right? I mean, it's ubiquitous now, um, but it, it's almost become a permanent trend in that for restaurant tours, sourcing local has become a critical piece in differentiation, but also meeting this consumer demand because just increasingly consumers want to know where their food comes from, how, do, how is it made? I mean, you can even see this coming down to the concepts of like um, Chipotle, where you actually get to see your food made, right? There's this um, uh, sort of interest in more about just food in general, who's growing and how is it made? So restaurants need to capitalize, or at least producers can capitalize on this. And people are willing, consumers are willing to spend more. I've done research on my own in different settings, both in restaurants, different types of restaurants. Consumers are willing to pay, they both state they're willing to pay more, but empirically they also are willing to pay more, okay? So it's this value-added product just by saying it's made or grown in Georgia. 
Um, so uh, yeah, just to, to, to sort of pick that up on what consumers are demanding, 38% say they are more likely to choose a restaurant that offers local food than one that doesn't. 30% want to go to a restaurant that uses some sort of environmentally friendly practices. So again, it shows this reflection that consumers are looking for this and it makes a big decision in their purchase and where they go out to eat. Um, another big important sector of the group is um, Gen Z or the younger generation who's also now looking at, they want to find more locally produced beverages. Okay, and I'll get into that in a minute. But again, this whole local movement is huge. So how do we connect the dots with connecting producers with restaurants right now? This is not necessarily just an easy connection to make in terms of, because there's layers, there are distributors and stuff like that, but there is a demand um, for restaurants. Okay, as a food person, a restaurant, uh, somebody worked in restaurants, like everything that we're making has a culinary application, right? Everything that's grown basically has a culinary application, right? Now there's differences in volume, but you know, we're eating all the stuff that we're talking about, right? Our fruits and vegetables, poultry, livestock, dairy, all this has some culinary application within the restaurant. The challenge is volume, right? You can't find, you're not gonna have uh, a single chicken grower supply Chick-fil-A or even a single Chick-fil-A with chicken that they won't ever keep up. They could, now a local farmer could potentially supply a Chick-fil-A operator with maybe cabbage or carrots to make the coleslaw. So there's like these ways to get some of this local produce into the restaurants, but obviously it's not just turnkey. There are some caveats, especially around volume. Um, but it's about finding the right restaurant, finding who wants to use this local food, connecting restaurants also, and the goal is to connect restaurants with these producers, who's near you where you can potentially source locally. Um, because also from a restaurant perspective, your local food is, your, what you source locally is, is significantly better quality than what you would get imported, especially when you start talking about distance and seasonality. Um, so the... Now, one of the things is about cost, right, is it's going to be way more, not way more expensive. Typically, it's more expensive to source locally, okay, because you have to pay for that more superior quality. But where the opportunities exist is in that customers are willing to pay more, right? So can you, in the restaurateur, potentially pass that cost along to the consumer and done through menu marketing, right, just by simply having a server tell the person, Running a special saying we're featuring local produce, that right there you can is, is value add. Okay, so you're able to say, I'm going to commit to paying a little bit more for a local apple uh, because then I can put on my menu that these are apples and I'm making fresh local Georgia apple pie, right? You're able to get a little bit more for that. Um, so it's about just sort of connecting those dots. And again, it's, it's not as easy as pie. No pun intended, but there are those connections there, right? Those connections can be okay. So the last piece I'm going to talk about, sort of in a similar thing, but a, a new piece, at least to the ag forecast, is looking at Georgia's alcoholic beverage industry. Okay, and it's classified as breweries, wineries, and distilleries. Um, I'm not going to go into the definition of those, but that's how it's categorized, and at least it's um, uh, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, narrows them out down like that. But let's get a just a quick snapshot of the trends. We are increasing again. Let me see if I can do this. Okay, total sales from 2006 on up, steady, steady. I mean, pretty significant increase. Obviously, we had a dip around COVID, but then right back. So you can see already that there has been just in terms of popularity, Americans are drinking more. I know uh, the average, uh, I think the average American last was uh, 2.5 gallons of ethanol per person. Um, but 10 years ago, it was 2.2. So I don't know what that means if people are drinking more or not, but either way, there is a trend of more consumption. And I thought this was a really important piece because Look, this is about value of the product in inventory, right? So what you're making, what they're producing, look at the value increase of these uh, products, right? So 
we, the beverage industry is sort of in this renaissance where it's become a craft product and the value in these products is really um, mirrors that demand and consumer consumption around alcohol. And then I'm gonna get to this piece and um, expand on this in a minute, but just to get an idea of like where, how important is where the sales occur. So it's not quite 50-50, but it is pretty close in terms of off-premise sales and on-premise sales. And this is where agritourism and getting people to go to the producers is absolutely critical. Okay, and I'm gonna get more into that, but you can see it's not just like everyone's buying the stuff at the liquor stores. Significant amounts are people going to the property, and this is national, this is a national statistic. Um, same trend here, which I'll get to in Georgia. Um, again, this is a growth of number of distilleries, breweries, and wineries. So distilleries, wineries, and breweries, but just look from the 20 year growth at the number of brews and distilleries and wineries, right? It is a huge sector that is growing significantly um, across the country. Now, Georgia is very similar. Our, okay, our, um, our growth okay, in the number of operations, I'm gonna break down a little bit um, just by sector, I'll go into quickly about breweries, wineries, and distilleries. Um, the breweries have, I mean, we've seen a lot of growth, okay? And this, one of the trends was around 2014 when the whole craft beer movement started to pop up. Saw a big spike in number of breweries, but actually also in Georgia. We went from four, uh, 14 to 41 in just three years. So there was a lot of growth. Um, a lot of independent craft beers, um, according to the craft beer uh, association or the craft brewers association, Georgia ranks 18th in the country with about 170 different breweries, uh, craft breweries, okay? Um, so important movement, okay? Uh, but it's our largest contributor within that beverage segment, segment um, $1.1 billion in gross final demand, which is basically like a gross domestic product proxy, um, which assesses like total inventory and sales. It's really just the value of the product, okay? Um, it is demand. So it's, um, it peaked, but what we've seen is that it's, it peaked in that, that craft brewery time um, and it's steady, but there is still continued growth. So there are still more breweries coming out, okay? Um, so Georgia's brewery, I think it's, uh, yeah, 1.1 billion uh, was the, the, uh, the highest in terms of um, gross final demand. Okay, so our winery, same thing. Uh, the U.S. winery went from 1,000 to 5,000. Um, Georgia, we I think the data only goes back. I mean, it doesn't go back quite to 2022. But right now, if you think about the industry is dominated by California, obviously, but Georgia right now ranks 17th in the country with 48 wineries. Okay, that number is also growing. Um, and uh, basically, yes, wineries. I mean, we saw that explosion of wineries, especially in North Georgia. So the demand in wineries and their production has grown as well. Uh, okay, so yeah. Um, and then the distillery sector, okay. Another area of significant growth. Um, in 2021, we had 33 active distilleries, which made us about 14th overall in the country. So you get the idea of where our volume is. Um, again, there was this big peak around 2014. It's leveled off a little bit, but there has been between 2017 and 2021, the number of distilleries tripled within, within Georgia, okay? So lots of new distilleries opening. Um, so yeah, significant growth, okay? In the last five years, their um, gross final demand went from 9%, 1.3, 9.46, 8%. 9 .46, 8%. So just growth, 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 growth within distilleries. To give you an idea where that puts us in a comparison to other states, we are above average in terms of overall demand compared to the US. And in the last five years, you can see we have, compared to the rest of the states or the rest of the US is on an average, significantly more um, demand in product, okay? So, one of the critical things for the sector here in Georgia is the ability to have people come on property, okay? In conversations with 
I've had conversations with uh, winemakers, brewers, and distillers where um, getting your product to a distributor can be very challenging. Okay, not only finding the distributor, if they take you, sometimes the, the, the amount the distributor takes is so much that you won't make money and the brewers, some breweries have gone out of business. Okay, so critical is getting people on the property, right? And that's where that agritourism piece really comes in, okay? Most of our establishments in Georgia of all the producers are open for visitation, right? And so that means tours, tastings. <clears throat> Has anyone ever been on a, a, a brewery, winery, distillery tour, right? So um, it's there's a lot that goes on there too, right? But that's another piece where this hospitality plays in, right? Because, you know, part of that tasting room experience is learning about the, the context of the beverage. Um, so that service piece is really critical. Um, so yes, and just so you know how what it means in terms of agritourism for the state. So these three beverage sectors comprise um, the second highest agritourism category within the Department of Ag's uh, database, right? So it is really important for the industry to get people because without them coming, Right, they don't have a place to sell. Right, they're not able. They, even some of them might have a direct sale um, or, or self distributor license, but again, very challenging. So they're relying on people coming. So what are the last trends? And I'll wrap up. Um, so how do these? How do you differentiate yourself in a very competitive market for the place, especially around beverages? I mean, think about how many beers, beer producers there are, breweries across the country in Georgia. I mean, we, there's a lot of them. Okay. How do you differentiate yourself in this competitive marketplace? Now, um, one of them obviously is following this farm to table movement, right? Finding local, okay? Now, that can be a challenge, okay? So let's just look at breweries. So hops don't really grow well in Georgia. Um, I know they've been thought about it. There's been a couple of experiments, but it's not, not nearly enough ways that you can like have significant beer production with hops grown. So how do you utilize um georgia products or anything georgia grown to make that beer georgia right um so we've seen and this is where i think is will you know um when we hear from dr fonts after this about what are some of those commodities that can actually be used in brewing right so i mean like blueberries has anyone ever, ever had a blueberry beer okay so like blueberry beer um any type of citrus but all our satsumas i mean making uh, uh, citrus is a really good Flavor additive. So you see these brewers starting to add not only fruits, uh, fruits, but also things like chocolate, honey, local honey, right? All this that are being local products that are thrown in that are, you know, not the primary input. Okay. Oh, another thing we heard this too. You got it. Uh, we have some of the best water in the whole country. So automatically, by having uh, beverages produced from our own water, there's already a quality just by. Um, Georgia. Okay. Same thing in wines. How can they go local? Now, our native grape, the uh, muscadine. Does anyone add muscadine wine? Okay. It's a little sweet. Now, the problem is that nationally, our, our, our Americans' flavor profiles are demanding a little bit more of the drier wine. So, what are producers doing? They're actually like taking muscadine wines and making them more dry in European styles to uh, to modify the production, but also new hybrid grapes, so we're seeing new hybrids to meet this demand. So yes, growing locally, having our own um, grapes. And then for distillers, um, again, it's really hard in terms of getting your main inputs, like, you know, but you, there is possibilities to leverage, if you use local corn to make your bourbon, you can then leverage that idea in that same way of getting people, it's a value added product, right? So um, you see distillers not only having primary inputs such as you know uh, rye and wheat and stuff like that but again the volume might be an issue you have to do small batch production but where you get flavors you get botanicals you get stuff added to gin um, so there's all these opportunities to integrate georgia products into the beverages so all three sectors are in significant growth um, the trend in sourcing local will be really critical but i think the most important thing for the beverage industry here in georgia is promoting the visitation, okay? That is how they succeed, and that ultimately adds um, uh, economic development for everyone. So thank you, and we'll turn it over to, to my colleague here.
Hey, Dan, while you are changing speakers, I'll just tell everyone that we have started an extension um, beer making workshop. So that's another offering we have. I'm doing a lot with our extension with science team in, um, in not just beer, but wine. We have a new viticulturalist, so right. lots of great support for that. I think that's, that's really exciting especially from the production side, but then just the marriage of the two. I think the we'll, next thing we hope to get is an knowledge in the next couple of years. So. Okay. That'd be fun, too. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So what about what the year 2024 will look like for Zosia campgrounds, campers, Harvey Park, Red Table, and those kind of camping establishments? So... I'm not entirely, I uh, don't know too much about the camping infrastructure, but I think it's going to, it mimics the same demand, especially in um, sort of short radius travel, right, within state. So um, I, I think the more that, say, campgrounds can leverage their and market their properties, the better. But the demand is there, the volume. Yeah, why do you think it has increased in the the company. <laughs> so I had this. We talked about this in my class with students because I'm like, where did? Why is that? Like, one they thought, is it? Um, is it a reaction? Right? Is it? Uh, everyone needs a drink after all of that. Maybe. Um, I think it really is that. I think from a consumer perspective, we're starting to see the beverage industry that that the local aspect. Is and, and the, there's been increase in the premium and cr uh, craft distillers and brewers. So I think you're seeing um, people are just it, it's, it's, like, it's about the a personal be, way, uh, like split. drinking more. Now I don't know about center. I had that same hunch, right? Is this a reaction to COVID? But good left, right. I bet when we look next year, it's going to be even. Right, right, I think it's going to be even higher than just that. There is because the product's better. There's better product across the board than there was 20 years ago. Are, are millennials drinking more? No. No, they're drinking less. But they drink more expensive things. I learned that at the first workshop. <laughs> <laughs> they do. There's not so much, uh, the volume isn't there, and the whole movement around sort of health and dry January. But where they are is they are, they, like to travel. So they are going out and doing these agritourism experiences and the brewery scene, even if you're not a heavy drinker, it's that community aspect. You're hanging out with people, socializing. There's sometimes farmers markets there. And so it's that sort of social phenomenon um, as well as, yes, the alcohol consumption. Is it the industry system that I think? Okay, sorry, okay, hey, we're out of time. No, sorry. I'll answer you afterwards, yeah. My bad. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's kind of hard to talk when my colleague Don, uh, ben, uh, Dan speaks first. <laughs> and I have a lot of information here. So if you, after this presentation, if you need even the slides, let me know, I'll present it to you. Because it's a lot of information. But we need to hammer this thing. All right, I'm going to be talking about the US Fruits and Tree Nut. I'm going to be talking about Georgia Fruit and Tree Nut. And then I'm going to talk about the takeaway message, which is also in our handout. Then I'll talk again about the U.S. vegetable of pulse. I'll talk about the Georgia vegetable of pulse, and then takeaway. Let's start with the fruit and nut. That is a very loaded graph over there from 1990 to 2024. You can see the green light is export. The green lines are export. What we sell to other countries. And the yellow one is what we buy from other countries. You can see... I'm talking about the U.S. agricultural trade, not vegetable, not fruit. I'm talking about the total agricultural trade, which includes all heavy equipment, everything that has to do with agriculture. You can see that we have been positive until come to 2022. For the first time, we dropped the yearly green line is export. We are short in export. So that is one of the indications that tells you that there's a problem in the economy. We have been very, very good for the past 33 years, 34 years. Okay, let's look at here. This one tells you the true picture. This is the arc trade balances. The balances, when we talk about balance, we mean we subtract export from import. 
If we export more, it means we have positive trade balances. If we import more, we have negative. So this is what this graph is showing you. The blue lines are the export. And this is overall agriculture, not only vegetables and fruit, overall. Now look at the green line at the bottom, is the balances. You can see that we've been having positive balances from 2014 to 2024. This is a 10 years graph. Until right now, from 2022 at the bottom here, you can see that we start getting negative. So in 2023, we have $9 billion negative. And then this year, it is forecasted to be $31 billion negative. That shows that we are beginning to get into trouble. And you can see on top, you can see also that the, the blue lines, which is export, is also declining. So those are indications that trouble is coming. Now look at this map here. Look at on your right hand side, you see the map. There are two different well maps. The one on top is export. The one at the bottom is import. Now you see the colors with the green, heavy colors are the main, our main export, uh, our main uh, business partners. For example, you see the green on top here, it's Canada. You see the one in the middle on top of Africa, that's Europe. You see the one at XM and there, that's China. Then you see the one at the bottom here, that's Australia. Then down here, you see Mexico. Those are our biggest business partners. Then on the bottom is the import, the people that we buy things from them. They are the same people, North America, Europe, China, Central America, Brazil. Now, the difficult part for this graph is the table that I put on the left-hand side. Look at from Mexico, our export was $27, $28 billion. And guess what? We imported $47 billion. So we were negative by $19 billion. And you can see that for all our partners, we are always negative. All the things on the red balances, red, 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 except China, where we had a positive of $25 billion. So even though we keep hitting China, China is our major partner. If we knock China out, we are finished. We have to keep diplomatic ties. Now let's go to the next slide. Let's look at the growers index. You see why uh, fruit and vegetable has a strong, despite all the problems that our farmers have, we still come up with a strong positive uh, uh, trade uh, index price. If you look at the large, the broken line at the bottom, that's the average from 2018 to 2020. Now you see that in 2021, the green light, the green line, we were above the average. So that's why, because we're getting better prices for our commodities, for our fruits. Oops. Then the blue line is 2022. We even got better prices than 2021. Then the brown line is 2023. We even had better prices, even though we had challenges with weather and all kinds of stuff. Those challenges make us get better prices because they create a natural shortage. And once there's a natural shortage, shortage the basic economic uh, uh, principle is the price goes up when the, the supply is low. So you can see that in July 2023, our price index was 155.4, which is very impressive. Now, in South Carolina and Georgia, freezing temperature affected production. Or if I know that, South Carolina, which is our second largest peach producing state, suffers 66% loss. Georgia, which is our third uh, largest uh, pitch producing state, suffered 78% loss due to the same freezing temperature. Now, the bad news here is other states like Colorado, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Washington, they all had positive. So what is the effect to us Georgians or to South Carolina with all the freeze that we've been getting? Because these guys are going to squeeze into our market and going to take away the things that we're going to produce. So that is a challenge for us. We are having getting hit by whether they are increasing their production. So they're going to take our market niche. Now, this table here shows you a clear picture of what is going on. If you see on top the red line that I put there from 2021, they shows how the trend is going down. Now, the yellow line at the bottom here, the little graph in the yellow graph here and here, I don't know if that's yellow or brown. My daughter used to correct me. It's the uh, California uh, clean stone pitch. Then the blue one is California free, free stone. South Carolina is green, Georgia is yellow. Now look at 2021, 2022, you see Georgia, that little yellow line over there. Then look at 2023, that line disappeared. Why does it disappear? Because we got hit by 78%, we lost our crops. That's why it didn't even show it. 
you used to, you have to use your binocular to see the yellow line there. You know? So we got hit so bad, and it's a major problem right there. In 2023, again, the expected pitch production was 543,000 uh, tons, which was 13% decrease from the last year, 2022 crop year. California freestone pitch was 260,000 tons, equivalent to 2% loss compared to 2022 crop year. The average 70% of freestone pitches were for export market, I mean fresh market, whereas the uh, clean stone pitches were for strictly for processing. Now look at this new kid in town, citrus. Again, this is US. I haven't gone back to Georgia. I'm still talking about the US right now. This is US here. You can see also the citrus industry is going down. We all know what is happening in Florida. And unfortunately, or fortunately, our Georgians have fallen in love with pitch. So we're going to talk about that. I mean, with citrus, we're going to talk about that. But in 2022, 2023 crop year, our production dropped 63% uh, fresh compared to 37% uh, process. Whereas last year, it was 50-50. So you can see the trend is changing very fast. That 63% drop was equivalent to 10% increase. Total citrus production was 9.4.9 million tons, which was 12% decrease from 2022. Lowest production ever in 50 years. Last year, we had the lowest production in 50 years. So that is telling us that even though we are falling in love with pitch, we have to be very careful. I'm glad that UGA is doing a lot of things. We're hiring new scientists to fill in the gap and start working on all those things, but it is scary. Florida decreasing orange production also helped the death because they have the disease they call volume bean or HLB. So this is the thing that I hear. They have spotted a few in Georgia already in some counties. Okay, Hurricane Irma and Hurricane I1 were all blamed for this decrease in production. Now, this is the big picture here. You see the long blue line here, that is the real total production in value. You can see that that also is dropping really fast from 2012, but they started dropping all the way from 19, uh, 1978. It started dropping and dropping and dropping. Then the, is it the brown line at the bottom? See here, it's also dropping. Everything is going down. Everything is going, that is scary. That is scary. Now, one thing that you're gonna be happy to, to listen to hear about is that this table, I put it here because if you see from 1997 to 2021, you see the gray lines in the middle is the time that we had recession. For example, in 2001, we had a recession. In 2009, we had a recession. and 2001, we had a recession. But the good news is the total food is increasing. Let's come back to the hospitality that you were talking about. Now, in 2020, everybody knows that we had COVID. That's why we had that bump down there, that drop. And then it continued growing. And it will continue to grow because people will always eat. Uh, the yellow line there is the food away from home, what you were talking about. So that graph actually captures what he, he was talking about. Now let's go to Georgia, back home. Farm gate value ranked by commodity. Um, on your left hand side, you have poultry and eggs, which is number one, generating 42%, $7.7 billion. Rural crops, livestock. But then the catch here is fruit and vegetable, uh, fruit and nut is 5.8%, vegetables is 7.21%. Uh, if you add the two, it becomes 12.92%. And that brings Georgia as the number third most important industry. So that fruit and vegetable industry, you cannot play with that industry anymore. They are very powerful. <laughs> now you can see this graph here, it shows you really good, the same situation. You can see poultry, 42%. You can see uh, raw crops and forage, 18%. But now when you add fruit and vegetable, it amounts again to 12.9%. It places Georgia, it, place, it places itself as the third position, third most important industry in agriculture now in Georgia. Third, very important. No, that's why I don't play basketball. I cannot even catch. <laughs> <laughs> now let's look at the fruit, the tree, not uh, farm gate value. Uh, this map here, I like it because it shows you at the bottom all the highlighted place, the blue, shows you where the major production is taking place. We came up with it uh, $1.1 $1 billion in 2022. Um, here, we break it down by percentage. Blueberries has finally surpassed pecan again. 
So blueberry is giving pecan a very, very hard time. When I came here to me two years ago, nobody could even catch pecans. But now blueberry is giving pecan a big fight, big, big fight. Now let's this one, this one shows a real uh, trend and uh, a 10 years trend in the three most important uh, uh, fruit crops that we have, which is pecan, blueberries, and peach. Now you see the blue lines there are the pecans. You see how they do well. This is farm gate value. You see how they do well, and they come back. You see here in 20 to 14, blueberry is green. It surpassed pecan. That was the first hit. Then pecan say, hey, hey, hey. Pecan put up a good fight. They work so hard, work so hard. Then what happened again in 2018? Blueberry hit pecans again. And pecans said, no, 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 we got to fight, we got to fight. And now in 2022, guess what? Blueberry hit pecans again. So blueberry is an industry to reckon with. And our peach has been very consistent. They are climbing, but very consistently. As my point, in 2022, they had a $81 billion in terms of farm gate value. Now let's look at blueberry. See, blueberry is number one. Let's talk about blueberry. These are the top 10 uh, blueberry counties. Bacon, Apple, World, all the way down to Lanier. Bacon County alone has 7,620 7, acres, generating $128 million. And at the bottom line, Lanier has 639 acres, generating $11.1 .1 million. Uh, right now, we have 27,192 acres of uh, blueberries in Georgia, generating a total of $449 million. This is a train, 10 years train for the uh, farm gate value for blueberries alone. You can see that it's doing pretty good. Uh, 2016 to 2018, they had a no problem, but they picked up and started going higher and higher and higher. So that tells you that the industry is up and running despite all the problems. Now let's talk about pecans. Pecans is the same thing. We have the top 10, starting with Michelle County with 21,400 acres, generating uh, is $49 million all the way to Calhoun with 4,600 acres, generating $10 million. Uh, right now we have 215,000 acres of pecans in Georgia. That explains also why we are we're number one. And not only in Georgia, not only in the US, but in the world, we're number one pecan producing state or country. If you put it in, uh, in terms of that, it's bigger than the United States, so we talk about country. And we're generating 41, 401,000 uh, million dollars in terms of farm gate value. Now you can see the trend here. Uh, pecan has been doing very well, but you will notice that in 2018, something happened. Okay. <laughs> we, are, we all know what happened in 2018, it hit us so bad. But after that, the industry has been working hard and picking up the slacks and climbing and climbing and climbing. And today we have $401 million in terms of farm gate value. So that industry is, up and, and that is going to get up. It's going to be even more than that because when you drive through uh, 41 and stuff, you see all the new orchards coming up, the new farms coming up, and stuff like that. And right now, this one doesn't even include some of those farms that are not yet producing. So we're going to go higher up again. Um, I'm sure we're going to beat Blueberry. So the two of them will be fighting. I like to be the referee, you know. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about Peach. Peach has always been number three. Uh, but uh, the top 10 are the Peach County, the Taylor County, and Macon County. Peach County alone has 2,500 acres, uh, generating $19 billion. And then we have a total of 11,733 acres right now in pecans in our Peach in Georgia, generating $81 million farm gate value. Now you can see the trend. Uh, you can see how it's going up again in 2017. I know some of the older folks here know what happened in 2017. We had a serious freeze that knocked down the, uh, the peach farms. And we lost about 50%, just like that. So you can see how it's showing there. But after that, the farms have been picking up. The growers are doing a wonderful job. And the, the, the uh, farm gate value is increasing as well. Let's talk about citrus, the new kid in town. Citrus is very new in Georgia. Uh, I, I still don't understand how we fell in love with it, but it's working pretty good. I'd like to give credit to Dr. McCain, who just showed up in my office. Said, Greg, I want you to do a citrus budget. I'm like, sir, how many citrus farms do we have? You know, He said, I just want you to do the budget. So the first time they invited me to give a talk uh, down in uh, uh, Lowndes County, I thought I was going to see about 10 farmers. I walked in the hall, there was 127 farmers. Mm -hmm. 127 farmers. Then the second time they called me, the hall was full with about 500 people. I'm like, 
my God, nobody knew about citrus, but this is what's happening right now. We have almost 1,700 acres of citrus here in Georgia, generating 24 million dollars. And these are the top 10 Lowndes Thomas Echoes doing a good job. And you can see the trend. In 2019, it was zero. Or it was very minimal that we didn't record anything because it was insignificant. But from 2020, guess what? $9 million, it's jumped to $30 million. And now it's $22 million. So you can see how fast that industry is growing. Let's talk about grapes. I have never spoken about, no, I don't say never. I have not spoken about grapes, paid attention about grapes because they've been very cool. But all of a sudden, they are picking steam as well. So they are now showing their space, maybe because of citrus, they said, no, we're not going to let citrus beat us. So grapes are coming up. I, I heard you talking a lot about grapes. They're coming up so much that uh, right now we have 1,914 acres of grapes in Georgia, generating $47 million. Uh, and the uh, top 10 counties are uh, uh, Gilma, Lonkin, Union. Gilma alone has 75 acres. If you come down here in Iowa, we have 850 acres. And then Calhoun have 180 acres of uh, grapes. So grapes, maybe because uh, uh, citrus came and they said, oh, no, we're not going to let citrus beat us. So they are steaming like crazy. Look at what they're doing here. This is your uh, 10 years uh, farm gate value. You can see that from 2012, there were only $6 million. And to 2022, 10 years later, $47 million in terms of farm gate value. They don't want citrus to catch up with them. So. Uh, let's talk about the 10 counties total fruit and not values. Okay, we have Bacon County, Aplin, Mitchell. Bacon alone is generating $129 million, uh, equivalent to 12.16% of the total. Let's talk about the farm gate value by cooperative extension district. We have four different districts, northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest. Southwest alone is generating 35% of the total, which is $6.4 million. Uh, Northeast is producing $5.3 million, which is about 28.9%, almost 30% right there. And all the, the, all the districts are doing relatively very well. Now, these are the takeaway here. Uh, the high price received by peach producers was instrumental in maintaining a strong growth price index in 2022. 2023 crop season. Uh, the good price were a result of the population uh, production shortages caused by the extreme bad weather uh, in the first quarter of 2023 that completely devastated Georgia and South Carolina. So uh, there's another thing that I didn't mention, a newly signed memorandum of export of uh, 800 tons of uh, uh, blueberries to the EU is going to help us a lot and maintain that blueberry price if that contract goes through. So they're still negotiating. I have not seen the latest report to see if it's only finalized. Maybe you might know more than I do. So, so yes. So that's going to be a very good thing for us. If we can take away additional 800 tons to Europe, that will maintain the price both abroad and local. Now, let's switch gears. Let's talk about vegetables. We talked about the total uh, trade, agricultural trade, which covered everything. But now we're going to... Oh, okay. Now we're going to talk about agricultural trade specifically for vegetables. Uh, the red line here are the exports. You can see that the export, what we sell to other countries, is that kind of constant. It doesn't move too much. But the import, what we bring in the United States, most of the speakers today talked about it. See how the import is climbing from 12.9 uh, in 2016 to 20 million dollars in 2000 days. Now, the bad news about that is if you subtract what we export and what we import, we have a negative balance of $12 billion in the vegetable industry, $12 billion. And that negative has started for the past 10 years, not just today, and it's still going to con continue because we are not producing as much as we should. And those have other repercussions or ramifications. Now, look at here, this is the uh, harvesting harvested areas in, in, uh, in the US. Uh, the harvested area and processing had a negative of 3%. Then the total was 2%. I've been told I don't have much time, so I'm going to skip. The total harvested area dropped by 2%. Then let's look at production. Production, we were 
successful because we've increased our production by 3%. I'm talking about compared in 2022 with 2023, we increased our production by 3%, 3.1%. Now let's look at per capita consumption, what each individual eats in terms of vegetables. We increased by 2.8%. In 2022, it was 380 pounds per person. And in 2023, it's 391 pounds. So that shows that Americans are eating a lot of vegetables. Now, this is what scares me a lot. This is the demand and supply. The red lines are the total vegetable that we need to sustain everybody in the United States if our per capita consumption is 391 pounds. But the little tiny blue line at the bottom there is what we produce. So we, this table has good and bad. The good part is that we have a lot of latitude. Our farmers have a lot of latitude to increase production if only they set the stage is set well for them. And that's where our policy guys needs to be. We listen today because they are the ones who can help here. And you can see that we are having a negative of 47 billion dollars uh, 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 quarter shortage in the US, even though we have the best farmers in the world. Now, I decided to do a little arithmetic. So I did this one. Let's look at the, all the vegetables here, excluding watermelon. An average American, it's 391. See the total here at the bottom, 391 pounds. Our population now is 340 million. You multiply that on this, <laughs> you see how much the demand is, and then you subtract the demand from what we supply. We are supply only 1.8 billion. So we are short by 131, that's right, million. Is that demand when you factor in imports too? Is that demand yes. being met overall? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so you see how short we are. And that is scary because in all the categories, now when we talk about vegetable, we're including fresh vegetables, we're including processed, we're including potatoes, we're including beans and mushrooms. We are so short that if we don't deal with the foreign markets, if we don't import, we're not gonna get enough. Okay, this is the farm gate value for Georgia for 2022. We had $1.3 billion. When I came here 20 years ago, Mr. Charles, it was only $600 million. So you can tell how this industry is so dynamic. When I came here 20 years ago, it was $600 million. And now it's $1.3 billion. So you can tell that the industry is really up and dying and vibrant. You see this graph here, we have about 33 different vegetables and every one of them is doing well. The big ones here are blueberries, I mean, uh, bell pepper, sweet corn, watermelon, onion. These are all the big ones. And let's look at the top 10 vegetable greens, um, uh, uh, the top 10 vegetables in 2022. On the left-hand side, I see sweet corn, onion, bell pepper, watermelon. But let me warn you, this is not constant. Every year it changes. Some year it's onion, that's number one. Some year is watermelon that's number one. But in 2022, it was sweet corn that was number, number one, generating 197 uh, million uh, dollars, uh, equivalent to 43, uh, 14%. Now let's look at the, the price index. The very uh, vegetable price index is quite a challenge. And that's why our farmers are taking a lot of risk because you can be the best economist in the world. There's no way you can forecast this one. You see here, average price in uh, 2018 to 2020 is the broken line. Uh, in 2021 is the blue line. It was a bad year for the farmers until uh, September when the price started going up. Then in 2022, the brown line, it was a very good year for the farmers. And then 2023 also started very good. Um, all, the, all the way to October, we had immediately 46% drop. So one minute is good, the next minute is bad. So it's hard for our farmers to figure that out. And when the crops are ready, what are you going to do? Let's look at cucumber, see how it is. 2021, 2022, 2023. There's no way you can predict. It goes up and down, it goes up and down, goes up and down. Look at sweet corn. That is the challenge that our farmers are having. It's a real challenge. Look at snap beans, same thing. Look at tomatoes, same thing. This year is good, or this season is good, or this, I mean, it's just something happening. And you can you'd be surprised that the farmers are still hanging in there. 
Now, I like this graph because this is onion. Onion used to be number one at one time, but let me tell you a little about this graph here. Look at uh, 20, the blue line, 2022. Look at the price of onion. The farmers got to kill. It's just like playing golf, you know, where you get one good shot, you're going to, you're going to come back, right? They got to kill in 2022. But get a look at 2023. It dropped so fast. Threw the farmers off. All right, uh, this year I'm putting here, I know one of my colleagues talking about it here, but if you look at the import price, which is also a problem, you find out that fertilizer is going to experience 17%, uh, decrease in fertilizer, especially nitrogen. Uh, potash is 15%, and uh, insect, herbicide, and fungicide will have to be 2%. And guess what? Interest rate is going up to 11%. I just read an article where they said they want to raise minimum wage to 17.55. How do you expect the farmers to, to, to compete? This is the world situation. Russia and Belarus are exporting 40%, okay, 40% of the global potash. And guess what is happening there now? USA is the main importer of Russia and Belarus. USA, top producer of nitrogen and phosphorus. But in 2021, EU and US impose a sanction on Belarus. So if you are imposing sanction, how do you get your crop? What do you expect the price to do? Got to jack up. China also imposed a ban on their export of phosphate. So these are the things that are killing our farmers. Then what again? COVID came in 2020, inflationary period in 2021, supply chain disruption, increased energy cost, extreme weather. In two years, successive years, the, the beach guys have been hit twice, consecutively. Now, Russia, Ukraine war, same problem. What about Israel, Hamas? These are all the things that are helping to crush our farmers, especially if our policymakers don't make the right decision. This is my simple takeaway, very simple here. Total vegetable and forest harvesting area is expected to decrease in 2024. Total average uh, vegetable import will continue to grow faster than export in 2024. Due to health reasons, American consumers will continue to eat more vegetable, thus increasing per capita consumption. With that, we wanna thank all our sponsors. And thank you all for listening. Yes, sir. When you have shown the price volatility um, of the different crops, yes, sir. Have you looked at it in terms of does that coincide with surges in imports? So when U.S. prices are dropping, does that coincide with surging imports coming in? Yes, it does. Some of them do. That's the reason why when the uh, blueberry uh, industry was waging a fight, I think it was probably called. Uh, I knew that they were going to win that fight because in the southeast we have a good case, but you go to the other side, California, it's inside better somehow. And the law says you have to show that you are impacting harm to the farmers. So how can you say the Southeast are the one having harm, uh, 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 incurring harm, and then the other ones are not? So that's the reason why I knew that there's no way we're gonna win that case. Yes, I'm, I'm factoring all this inside here. Any other question? Yes, sir. So about the, the citrus, why do you think there is such an explosion in production and demand? And do you think it will continue or do you think it will change? <clears throat> no, actually, citrus is going down. Citrus is going down. It's been going up for the past 10 years, you know, from Florida. Okay, we are trying to pick a little bit now. We have almost 1,700 acres of citrus. So we are picking up, and the disease has not yet come here, but a year. There are a few counties that they have spotted the uh, greening disease. They call it Chinese Huangbing or HLB. And uh, I know Laura can tell us better here. I think you have a couple of scientists that are going to be working on that, Laura. You discussed that in the extension meeting, which was very exciting to hear. The extension citrus specialist, basically, as the production is being decimated in Florida because of population increase. Um, political issues and the citrus screening is moving up and we found more varieties that are more cold tolerant um, but once again we're, we got to figure out how to further process because there's only so much fresh fruit you can sell so um, they have put in a couple of juice plants here so um, that's a way to diversify so um, we're working on that. One of the issues too on our spine with fruit is that producers that uh, Diversified, diversified, diversified to get away. The problem with diversifying continually is you have so little production of one crop, mm -hmm. you're not big enough to do something with it. 
So if you're growing satsumas and then all of a sudden you start to start to buy other crops or citrus, then your satsuma crop's not big enough to do anything with it to go bigger. So it's a it's an issue with respect to well, what producer you're doing on that respect. Mm -hmm. You gotta get big enough to do to do something. It's like processing wise, they, the processors that want to do 10 different varieties. They want to come in and do one variety and a lot of it and move on, right? Not little, little, little. That's the problem. Right now in Jordan, we don't have the market. Yeah. Yes, sir. Why is it that production of peaches uh, continue to decrease? Is that again, sir? Production of peaches? Yes. The overall production of peaches continues to decrease while production of peaches in South Carolina continues to increase. At one time, what we believe. We, we, we do four peaches in the state of South Carolina when that was, I did it many years ago. Yeah. Well, well, not, not, not recently. Not, not, not yeah, well, uh, in the last 10, 15 years, we haven't been a million. Yeah, why we do why well. Oh, well, there's, I think some of the varieties that we were growing before, mm -hmm. a peach tree only lives for so long. Mm -hmm. So those older varieties, the trees began to die off. Um, and, and possibly, you know, we did we did plant new trees to replace them. Yeah. Uh, and we've had a strong consolidation of peach and uh, peach industry. You know, there's four, three or four. I'm trying to remember now. There's either three or four farms that could that produce 90 percent of our peaches. Fresh part, fresh part. Did this to other crops? Well, they diversified with pecans. A yeah. lot of yeah. some strawberries. Yeah. Yep. Some agritourism. Is there a way we could attract uh, row crop producers like cotton or uh, corn who want to switch to vegetable? Is there, do you think? Oh, they do it all. <laughs> Trying to make money. No, they grow two vegetable crops um, on either side of a row crop a lot of the times. I mean, they're doing everything they can. And then the fact is like, yeah. And the more they diversify, the less crop protection, crop insurance. Well, and then you have to have more equipment. That's right. So that for us ends us. Uh, if you have more questions for Craig, feel free. Chase them down. Um, and so uh, here in a little bit, the livestock section will be in 219, and this room will be uh, nursery greenhouse and forest.